Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. It's Wednesday, so you know what that means. It's time for another midweek mini mail call, and this time we're on episode number 35. Amazing, as I say every time, just amazing. People are so generous sending in so many amazing things, it just warms my heart. So anyhow, without further ado, let's get right to it. Okay, we have a package here. This actually got to me in December, so it's less than a month old. Uh, it comes from someone who doesn't have their name written on here, Alameda, California. So that's in the Bay Area, just near San Francisco. And let's see what we got. What do we have here? Something long. <laughs> Something wrapped up really well. Packing material, and down here at the bottom, there's a letter and some stickers and things. So let's see, what do we got here? Let's go right to the note. It says, hello again, Adrian. For this shipment is the, for your Amiga, an 8088 bridge board and the 360K floppy drive. Maybe a cap or two has to be replaced, but both should work. Also included are some random stickers from where I used to work at Sun in the 90s. That's awesome. And some added owned stickers for fun. Also a NASA trash bag for your car. If you cannot fly on NASA flight, at least you can, <laughs> your trash can feel the warm embrace. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. This is like from their gift shop, I guess, right? <laughs> I love it. I love it. That is so cool. Where is there a NASA gift shop? That's cool. I've actually been to Cape Canaveral and I got to see the space shuttle land at Edwards Air Force Base in California. I mean, this was a long time ago. I was a kid. It was in the like mid to late 80s when that happened. But um, and the trip to the Cape, I got to see the launch pad. I don't think the shuttle was there. The shuttle was still flying at the time. I got to it was it was a really cool trip. They must have had a gift shop at the at the Cape, though. I don't remember getting a bag, though. <laughs> So an 8088 bridge card, um, this allows you to run a PC software on your Amiga 2000, actually any Amiga, I guess, um, and it plugs into the ISA slots and the Zorro 2 slot, so it lets you use actual PC type cards as well. And I have to say, I have never actually used a bridge board in my life. This is not emulation. This is really an entire PC XT on a card here, 8088. Uh, the RAM, everything is all on here. So there it is. It looks like it's in excellent condition. That is the Amiga Bridge card, and this is made by Commodore. Now, when you bought one of these back in the day, not only did you get this card, I don't know if this was included or optional, but there was a matching disk drive that went with it. And here it is. Um, in fact, I think it's the same exact color on this faceplate here as the Amiga 2000. So go in your five and a quarter inch bay and there was a matching floppy drive cable, which is right here, although there's nothing special about it. And you plugged it into this card right here and this let you read and boot from regular floppy disks, right? You could read the PC 720K disk in an Amiga, three and a half inch, no problem. But a lot of software back then was still coming on five and a quarter inch. So you did need a disk drive. And I think this was the packing one. This is a Chinon brand drive. Maybe not, maybe this is not the original one, I don't know, but um, any 360K drive will work fine. And yeah, it's pretty cool. I think you could set up a hard drive image on your Amiga hard drive. It's probably really slow. Uh, you could probably also install a PC hard drive controller and actually install a regular PC hard drive in there too, because this does have a regular BIOS on here. I'm not positive on everything it can do, but I, I know those slots were there. The ISA slots are there in the Amiga for a reason. And here are some of the stickers he sent. So there's like some microsystem stickers and... All right, well, let's uh, take a look at this stuff on the bench. Let's take a close up look at the stuff Stefan sent in. So first, let's take a look at these stickers. Owned by CDC, ColtDeadCows.com. That's cute. A really cool old vintage Sun Microsystem sticker. I just love it. It's a little faded, the, the purple color, but how cool. I'm pretty sure this is a Java logo here. So it's like a postcard basically. Uh, yeah, sun, java.sun.com. Before Oracle owned Sun, obviously. Guess who's dot com in the world? 
Oh, so very late 90s, early 2000s. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Terminal accessory, so these would have shipped with actual products. So it would have been stuck on the boxes probably. If anyone remembers these stickers on uh, products that they bought back in the day, please let me know. <laughs> what should I stick these on? And finally, stop the technology madness. <laughs> I just, I love it. Uh, yep, this appears to be a sticker as well. One of those clear stickers. Oh, that's just so cool. And here is the Amiga Bridge card, the very first one they made. Notice here it says PC Emulator A2000. I'm trying to get the glare off the camera. So uh, yeah, they call it an emulator, even though it's definitely not emulating much. Commodore basically took an XT and crammed it all onto this card. So it does have RAM here. I guess it's what, 512K of RAM. Here is the 8088 processor. There's space for a math code processor. And we have a floppy drive controller IC here. So you can plug the 360K floppy into this interface here. And that's because the Amiga itself doesn't natively support five and a quarter inch drives, at least not that I'm aware of. There's this 25 pin connector on the back here, which I haven't looked at the manual for this card, but I'm assuming this is a parallel port, PC compatible, or is it something for an external floppy drive? It could be, it could be either, I suppose. But yeah, so it plugs into the Zorro 2 slot, so this talks to the Amiga side, and then this 8-bit ISA interface plugs into the passive black plane that is on the Amiga, all Amigas actually, well, all the ones that take cards. So the 2000, the 3000, and the 4000 all have ISA slots on them. And it's only using 8-bit because this is an XT, but Commodore designed the 2000 with 16-bit slots in mind, meaning they intended to make bridge cards with 286s and higher processors. And eventually they did. I think there was up to a 386SX official Commodore card released, which you can upgrade using one of those clip-on 46 upgrades to a 46. So you get some decent capabilities with your Amiga. Jan Bita recently put out a video on the bridge card, which was really informative to me actually, because I'd never used one of these and it was cool seeing him use it. And he tells a story about how his father used an Amiga 2000 at home, but his work PC was a PC, an IBM PC compatible or something like that, and he needed to bring home software and files to work with. So he used the bridge card to enable that on his Amiga so he didn't have to buy two separate computers. That's pretty cool. That's really why they made this thing. So Stefan also sent me this five and a quarter inch disk drive here, which uh, I can put inside the Amiga. Now, I don't think this is the original Commodore one because if you bought the bridge card with the Commodore drive, it looked the same as I think a 1541 maybe. I, I, the styling was a little bit different. This just looks like a regular PC style, yeah, chin on drive here. So if anyone remembers getting this exact drive with their bridge card, please let me know. But I, I think this one is not original. This drive is a FZ502. Let's just quickly take a look to see if that is a 360 or 1.2. But I'm not finding the exact info other than some listings on eBay and stuff that indicate this is a 360K. The drive is a little rough, uh, rough and ready. On the bottom here, there's uh, definitely corrosion and stuff going on. This thing was probably exposed to the elements. So I'm gonna hook this up first to my test bench PC just to see if the drive is fully functional before I try to get it working. Uh, in the Amiga with this bridge card. Actually, first I am going to just give this thing a little bit of cleanup, uh, quite a bit of oxidation on the connector here. So a little deoxid dripped on there, cotton swab, that will clean it off to some extent. And I wanna just get a quick glance underneath this cover here. Hopefully I can see the read write heads. Maybe give those a little bit of a clean. I think two screws. Should get this cover off, maybe. There we go. Ah, yes. Ooh, lots of corrosion under there. Yeah, this uh, is very corroded. So you can definitely get an idea under there. Look at all this white corrosion on the aluminum. And the heads don't seem to move. So this is the head stepper motor right here, this round thing. And there's a band that runs around it. And the head seems stuck in place. So I'm just going to see what I can do to get that moving again. And on the underside, this is the stepper motor that drives the head, and unfortunately, it is frozen like a rock. It just barely turns. I've lifted up the PCB entirely just to get a better look, and unfortunately, I just don't think that there's any saving this drive. Uh, this is not going to move any longer. This thing has been exposed to too much harsh environment for too long, 
And even though aluminum doesn't normally corrode or rust, it does get corrosion on it, which is going on here. And it's definitely like the motor shaft here is some kind of a steel and it has fused. The bearings have gotten gone solid. This motor, the motor just refuses. Oh, oh wait. Oh, wait a second. I was just pushing on it and it's very scratchy sounding, but it is moving. Look at that. Wow, look, even, even this has all this corrosion under there. Wow. All right, well, I'm gonna try to give this a little bit of lubricant, so a couple drops of uh, silicone on there. And now it's all about servicing the drive, cleaning the heads, cleaning off the dust around the heads, and then lubricating all the moving points. I put some bearing oil into the main stepper motor and just giving everything a general clean. It's kind of crazy, the corrosion and dust that's all over the place. But yeah, when you're doing a disc drive like this, just look at everything that moves and just carefully lubricate each of those points. I hooked up the 360K drive to the test bench. Let's power it on for the first time, see if it blows up or something. Nope, no blowing up. So nothing exploded. So let me set it for 360K and save changes. I think I'm gonna have to set the jumper on here to drive select one, because that's what the PC wants. This would have been drive select zero on the Amiga most likely. The jumpers are right here. We have RM and then DS zero, one, two, and three. And yes, it's currently set for drive select zero. And there we go, drive select one. Let's test that again. Well, it says floppy drive A failure, so that's not a good sign. Let's put this in here. The disc spins, so that's good. In IMD, I'm gonna use the clean head option. I'm gonna hit nine times. It's gonna try to seek the head back and forth as much as possible. Let's see what happens. Well, it's certainly seeking now, all right. I'm gonna peel the sticker off the stepper motor here, which should expose us to the bearing. Actually, some of the oil I put on the top has made its way all the way down to the bottom there. I can actually see it's a, it's a little bit wet with oil here. I was gonna add some bearing oil into the bottom here if this was dry, but it looks like it's not. So I'm just gonna put some tape back over there and continue exercising the drive. So I'm gonna go, but I'm gonna do the clean head option again with the drive upside down here and let it kind of work its way, the oil back through the motor there. Let me actually run this thing through a cleaning cycle, even though I did clean the heads with the little pad thingamajiggy, but I'm um, not sure if I'm supposed to put alcohol on these other side ones as well. So let's just add it everywhere. There we go. And I'm going to do clean head again, and I'll just do three. Here we go. So drive is clean, it's lubricated, it seems to be seeking okay. Let's try this floppy disk here, which is a formatted 360K disk. Let's see if alignment test in here is able to read it successfully. All right, so it's reading track zero and 20 is correct for a DOS formatted disk. If the 20 were over in the second column here, that means that it was thinking it was on track zero, but it was actually reading sectors from a different track. So if I hit one, it should jump to track 10. And that's normal that it has like, you know, a couple sectors lost after it first seeks, and now it's back to 20. So that's working. Three. So now we're on track 30, and we're reading off of head zero, so the bottom head. If you push the H key, it will switch to the top head. And it's good, it's still reading 20, which means uh, the top head is working. Let's jump to 40. And there it is, track 40. We got 20 sectors, and I hit H, so H zero, H one getting the right number of sectors on both. So it seems to be reading the disc properly. So I've been fiddling around with the drive and I don't know, it's weird. I can't format discs in N format, but I can in DOS and discs seem to work fine. So this is a copy of Planet X3. I copied it onto this 360K floppy on another machine. And if I run it, it does seem to work totally fine. And I did test before recording this footage, copying all of the files 
off of the disc onto the hard drive just to make sure it can read everything. The disc is nearly totally full with this uh, floppy disk. And yeah, the game works fine running directly off the disk. Drive's not making any weird noises or sounds or anything. So I really can't explain why everything is working. And yet I can't format the disk with N format. I've never seen that problem before. I, and I use N format all the time on this computer. I really don't understand why it's not able to format a disk. It always says that there is a bad sector on the second side on, at head number one, uh, and it won't, it refuses to format. And yet it seems to work perfectly. So don't quite understand it. Um, so it's like something is still slightly wrong with this drive, but it definitely should work well enough in the Amiga as it is here to at least read and copy files off disks and, and use it. So I'm gonna do that. Here's my Amiga 2000 that I'm going to be putting the bridge card into. Um, this machine, eh, have I showed this on the channel much? Not a lot. I've had this machine for quite a while. Uh, this was not a donation. I actually bought this thing from a computer store that was going out of business here in Portland. This was quite a few years ago. But yeah, it's a few little mods here and there. So it's um, it has a lid, of course. <laughs> I have the battery, a CR2032 right here with a diode. So it's outside for easy changing. Well, outside it's under the front cover. This does have an accelerator card, a GBP. I think it's 40 megahertz, 68030 with a math code processor. I do have a video toaster in here. This came in the machine, although I don't think I've actually used it in here. So that's kind of funny. Um, this machine, when I got it, the floppy drive was completely dead. So what's in here right now is a TIAC PC floppy drive, 1.44. But this drive actually completely works with the Amiga. You just have to flip a few jumpers that are on the back and there are guides online on how to do that. You don't need an adapter like I showed on the channel a little while ago, the one that the viewer sent in. This did come with a single speed CD-ROM drive in here. And uh, while it does work, uh, I have no use for it because it's, uh, it's, it's actually just serving as a place, as something to fill in the hole because I don't have that blank cover for the computer since this was in here when I got it. Uh, plugs, the SCSI controller is on the accelerator, so this has a fast 32-bit SCSI controller. I do have an SDIEC in here, one of the little small ones with the little trans-flash type cards on it. So that's for booting this machine. And otherwise, yeah, this machine is pretty much stock. I think it's got maybe Kickstart 3.1 in here. It's ECS. Don't have any other cards in here. Um, it's a revision 4 motherboard which actually, while that works, oh, and the battery damage was very minimal. There was pretty much just a little bit of corrosion around the ground plane around the battery. So that was caught early. But unfortunately, there's one weird issue with this machine is when you turn it on when it's cold, it doesn't boot up. Um, it just sort of hangs. And you either have to reset the Amiga with the keyboard or power cycle it, and then it boots normally. I think it has something to do, oh, and it only happens when the accelerator's in here. So I think that has something to do with the way the accelerator works with this like 4.x motherboard that it would be fixed if I modded this into a 6.0 or 6.1 motherboard or whatever it is. If anyone has any thoughts on that, please let me know. But anyways, it doesn't stop me from putting the bridge card in here and uh, let's go ahead and do that. Oh, I forgot to add, I'm gonna be replacing this 1.4 meg drive with a real Amiga drive. And the reason why I'm doing that is because this is a much thinner profile. It is like designed for a PC and the Amiga drive is thicker, so it leaves a big gap on the bottom, which I think is kind of ugly. I'm sure I could find something to 3D print, a little spacer, and then paint it and whatever, but ultimately I'd rather just use the real floppy drive here. And actually I have two, um, but this one here is a parts drive now. Both of these came from George, the guy who donated uh, the Commodore PET 2001 to me. He donated an Amiga 2000 as well. It was in, unfortunately, really, really rough shape inside, battery had leaked, it had also been dropped. So the case was all bashed on the corner here and the motherboard was damaged. So I salvaged out um, all the parts out of it, uh, including some really cool cards and things. I had a 68040 accelerator, but it's not working actually either. I think battery corrosion got to it or something. Uh, but anyways, two floppy drives, one was missing the faceplate. Um, both didn't work, <laughs> but I took both and combined them and cleaned them and lubricated them and made one working drive with the faceplate, which is what this one is. Um, this one actually just needed a good clean, but the main problem with it is it had one surface mount cap right here that had leaked and the motor wasn't spinning properly and whatnot, but with a replacement cap, cleaning that up, 
this drive now works really well. Um, and I did uh, install a little floppy door on here. And this was something I had in my parts bin. Notice it's like a white color. I don't know where that came from. It's compatible. The faceplate um, is from this other parts drive here. And then the LED is from this as well. And unfortunately, these are a little bit different the way that they work on the bottom. So the LED connects right here. And it's slightly different, which is why on this one, the LED actually sticks through the front a little bit and it's not flush. When it was on here, the faceplate and the LED, it was flush. But this drive, unfortunately, while it spins up, it will refuse to read anything at all. So I think there's some circuitry damage on here uh, that is causing this to not work at all. So like I said, parts drive, but this works. So this is going in here as well, along with this five and a quarter inch disc drive for the bridge card in replacing the CD-ROM. Bridge card goes in and hopefully it all works. And I am back together. The bridge card is still not installed, but the machine should be working. So if I power this on, and I'll pop this disc in here. This is the um, Amiga test kit disc. Hey, it's actually booting. So it was off for a few minutes and notice it just worked. But if it's off for a long time and I turn the computer on, it will just sort of hang and not boot. Anyhow, it worked. Uh, the disk drive is working. I know this works. I did full testing when I took it apart and cleaned it and stuff. So, okay, I think now let's put the bridge card in this machine. In the Amiga 2000, you'll see here are the ISA passive slots. They're not hooked up to anything except for power unless you put a bridge card in. And then here are the Zorro 2 slots. So there are two that are a combination of 16-bit ISA slot plus a Zorro 2. So this is going to have to go into one of those two slots. Before sticking it in, I was going to plug the floppy cable into here, and I noticed there's no marking for pin one on the front or the back. There's no way to tell. Now, this does have a key where there's a missing pin, but unfortunately, this cable I'm using, it does not have that key. So I guess I'm just going to have to guess which way this goes. Being the card is in the Zorro 2 slot, which is already hard to connect, and the 8-bit ISA, you really have to give it a good shove to get that in there, but hey, that went in okay. Now, if I connected the floppy drive cable backwards, when I power on the computer, the access light on the five and a quarter inch drive will just come on and be solid. So that's the indicator that it's in backwards. So let's see what happens. Nope, it's off. So I guess I hooked it up right, guessing. None of the bridge card software is installed. So this card won't really do anything, but I'm just gonna run sysinfo really quickly and look to see if I at least see this card in the slot. There we go, it says Commodore Bridge Board, 513 slash one and 512K of RAM is mapped. Keep in mind on Amigas with Zorro 2 slots, which is specifically the Amiga 2000, it can only map eight megabytes of RAM into the Zorro 2 slots. So if you have an eight megabyte RAM expansion card in one of these slots, there won't be any more space for cards like the Bridge Board, which as you see up here is taking 512K is, is being mapped into that address space. So I think there's eight megs of address space total for all the cards so just keep that in mind. It auto configures the cards. The cards will you know, figure out where the memory should be mapped in, but you will run into issues when you have eight megs of RAM plus cards, that won't work. But luckily this accelerator has, I think eight megs of RAM on it and it is in a 32 bit address space. So it is mapped outside of the Zero 2 space. So it won't conflict with cards that I put in here. All right, so I have the 2000 connected to the TV here. We got color display. And I have my GoTech hooked up. So I downloaded the latest version of the software for the bridge board for this 8088 version. And I have it in here. It's Amiga Janus. I'm going to click the README first. How much you want to bet we're going to double click on this and it's going to be some kind of useless information. All right, so this software works on all of the bridge boards, including the sidecar version for the Amiga 1000. That's cool. First step is install the hardware. Well, duh, I already did that. And we're going to install the software. That's it. There certainly wasn't very much useful stuff in there. So we're just going to run the installer here. Hopefully this works on this. Uh, I'm running Workbench 3.1. Kickstart, I think, is also 3.1. So hopefully this is compatible. If not, I can swap out the SD card for a 2.01. I guess um, we'll do expert. First question is, does your system have separate boot and system partitions? Um, no, I don't think so. I think everything is on this one Amiga drive, which is uh, basically 1.7 gigabytes or so. Yep, it's 188 megs in use. It, this might look like it has games and stuff loaded on here, but there's actually pretty much nothing on here. So I'm just going to say no. What do we got? We got a 2088. Honestly, I'm not really sure what any of these options mean, so I'm just going to keep the defaults. 
There we go. Fingers crossed that this actually works. If you watched Jan Bita's video on this bridge board, he had all sorts of issues on his. It all seemed to kind of stem from his bridge board itself with chips being loose and bad contacts. We'll see if that happens with this board. This procedure will now set up part of your Amiga hard drive as a PC hard drive. Okay, proceed. Please choose the direction you want to place your auto boot virtual drive. Okay, let's proceed in there. Amount of megabytes, maximum size is 32, so we will just do 32. Drive C, that's fine. Here we go. Wow, this creates the drive. I used to be super proficient at the Amiga. Uh, I had a 2000 for a number of years and I knew that thing inside and out. And then that was the last Amiga I ever had. I never had anything after the 2000, I went to PCs. I'm pretty rusty to this day. I seem to have just forgotten a lot of things about how the Amiga worked. I knew how to manipulate all the system files and do scripting and all sorts of things. And it's really kind of faded from my memory. I'd say around 1995 is when I ended up getting um, a Windows 95 PC that was pretty powerful. Well, I, I've always ha I had a PC up until that point, but I got a Windows 95 PC and I used that predominantly. I stopped using my 2000 for the most part and uh, sort of forgot a lot of this stuff. So do you want your auto boot drive protected from deletion? Nah, whatever, no. Uh, something about the buffers here. All right, that's fine because I have lots of RAM on here. Please insert your boot disk in the drive you booted from and click proceed. If the data is in the drive, okay. I don't really know what it's talking about. Problem with startup sequence. Oh, great. So that didn't work. Did it actually do the install or did that just crash entirely? That is terrible. Well, there is a drawer here called PC. Let's move it off to the side here. Let's look in there. All right, well, there's stuff in here. So does this mean it's going to work still? I don't know, PC prefs. Oh boy, uh, I'm going to reboot the computer. Hopefully that helps. And it's screwed up. Look at that. Can't open Janus library, I'm sure. Yeah, I won't be able to start anything. There's the virtual drive at least. Okay, in the CLI, I assigned the startup uh, to be Amiga colon S, which I think should do what the installer wants. And I'll try installing this again, and hopefully we don't error out this time. All right, cool, it got a little further. So it's asking me here about this enforcer thing and CPU and set CPU. So let's check what the help is, because I don't know what this is. Enforcer keeps the bridge board dual port of RAM from being cached by the 68OXO processor. So I guess we definitely want enforcer because the CPU commands just turns off the caching entirely. This slows down the entire CPU. Uh, it's 2.0 compatible, cannot be used under 1.3. Okay, that's fine. It is recommended you install Enforcer for better performance and set CPU disables all caching to off. This slows down the entire CPU. Okay, so we are going to use Enforcer. Here we go, proceed. Okay, install complete. Good sign, it's better than it was before. So did this actually make a working setup? Let's check again. And right away, could not open the library. Well, at this point, well, I'm gonna reboot here since it's not working, but not holding out hope. This is sort of similar to the problems that Jan ran into on his. And really his issues were all about the bridge board itself not working properly, but talk about horrible diagnostics. Is the issue I'm having with my bridge board? Is the issue I'm having with the software, like my system install? Where is the problem exactly? Because it's certainly not being particularly clear. After a reboot, I am not holding out hope. Yep, could not open. <sighs> Such crap. Unfortunately, no matter what I do, I cannot get the bridge board working. I actually ended up reseeding all of the ICs on here using uh, Deoxit in all the sockets as well. I even went as far as changing out the CPU. After doing a little bit of research, the way this seems to work is when you launch the software, what it does is it boots up the PC and the BIOS on here will actually write to the shared memory, the, the dual ported memory that's right here, this uh, 128K. And that's how the software on the Amiga side knows it's running. So when you get this could not open Janus.library error, that specifically means that it timed out trying to talk to that shared memory. Now there could be a ton of different faults on this card causing this error and there's really no way to do any diagnostics on this thing. So that's why I swapped out the CPU and I even did read the BIOS chip that's on here in my TL866 programmer just to make sure that it was good and 
Not that I have an original copy to compare against, but it reads fine. And I see code in there and I, you know, messages and it looks like a regular PC BIOS. I even went so far as to boot this computer off Workbench 2.0. It still has a Kickstart 3.1 ROM in here, so I didn't change that. But I did a 2.0 and it didn't really make a difference. I installed the software on, on a fresh hard drive, basically a different SD card. So that didn't make a difference either. I did some Googling and read several threads on Amiga forums looking for people who are having same similar problems with this uh, 2088. And yeah, there's definitely people with this same error and who can't get the card started. And some who even say when they pop in uh, like a 286 bridge board, the same software install works perfectly on the same machine. They put this one back in and they're getting this message. And unfortunately, no one had any kind of troubleshooting, diagnostic information. There's no schematics for this. I mean, I can't find anything about troubleshooting. And if you watch Jan Bita's video, the one I mentioned, he had this exact error and he reseeded these chips and handled the card, you know, whatever that meant, like bending it or whatever, and then it started working for him. Incidentally, I tried both slots that this thing can go into. That didn't make a difference. And after all my fiddling around, the card is still showing up here on system configuration. So it's not like it's dead in the water totally, because it is seeing it, but the PC side is not starting. So for now, I'm gonna call it that this board is no good and doesn't work. But otherwise, Stefan, thank you very much for sending in the bridge board, the floppy drive, which does seem to work now, and these cool stickers. And that's gonna be the end of this video. It really bums me out that I couldn't get that bridge board working. Maybe I'll be able to fix that in a future episode, but if you have any clues or ideas on how to get that thing working, definitely please let me know. Anyhow, that's gonna be it. You know what to do if you liked it. If you didn't, you know all those youtube -y things, and that's gonna be it, so stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.